How mm -hmm. are you today? I'm Brandi Harvey. I'm going to be your moderator for this month's Vault Live training experience. And we have the none other than Tristan Walker, founder of Walker & Company Brands and Bevel. So we're excited that this month you are going to learn something new, but go ahead and hit the subscribe button because we need you all to be notified when we're going live. So we're excited to have this conversation with Tristan Walker today. All right, so y'all, I do my homework, you know? Even though the staff has talked about my legal pad, they, they didn't think I was going to mention it, but I totally am going to mention it because they talked about my legal pad. They want me to get something new, but you know what? I'm kind of like a dinosaur. So here we go. I'm an 80s baby. Here we go. All right. So Tristan, you're the founder and CEO of Walker and Company Brands. You serve on the boards of Foot Locker, Shake Shack, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. You've been in Fortune Magazines. They've named you 50 of the world's greatest leaders. I mean, come on now, black man. 50 of the world's greatest leaders. In 2018, your company was acquired by Procter & Gamble and made you the first, the very first black CEO under the umbrella in their 180 year history. Long time. Talk <laughs> about black history in Black History Month. In What's real up? Time, in real time. So what were your dreams growing up in Queens, New York? What were your dreams? I want to get rich. That was it. That was it. As and, quick uh, as possible. I was very focused. <laughs> I was very focused. Um, yeah, I grew up Queens, uh, Queens, New York projects, you know, typical story that everyone tries to give. But I knew I needed to get out of it. Yeah. And um, there were a few pathways to try to get out of it. And ultimately I realized entrepreneurship was the best way for me to do it and acquire wealth quickly. Uh, Cause the other pathways didn't work for me too well. Yeah. You know, I couldn't play sports that well. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't act that well. Um, and you know, I needed to find another way and entrepreneurship provided that pathway for me. Thank goodness. Thank goodness for entrepreneurship. Thank goodness. But there was something else when I was doing my research on you and studying you stated that you didn't know what wealth was mm -hmm. until you were 14 years old. You uh, got introduced to something, but before you were introduced to boarding school, 75 cents changed your entire life. Yeah. Tell us how 75 cents changed your life. You do do your homework. I do. That's good. <laughs> I, uh, I had the good fortune. Uh, we had an after school program at the Boys Club in New York. Um, and to get in, 75 cents. Uh, and I tell folks it was the highest return on investment that my yeah. mother ever made for me. Yeah. Um, they had a, an education program where they introduced uh, young black kids to boarding schools around the country, some of the top boarding schools around the country. You had to take a test. If you did well, you can apply to those boarding schools. Unfortunately, I did well and got in. Uh, and those four years changed my life. Um, you know, I got to go to school with people with last names like Rockefeller and Ford. Yeah. Right? Uh, and that's when I really understood what wealth meant, not what being rich was, but what wealth meant. Uh, and that completely changed my entire life. Yeah. You saw rich in the hood. <laughs> you saw wealth when you went to boarding school. That's right. That's right. And um, I knew I wanted it. Yeah. And it wasn't only wealth in terms of dollars, but, you know, the reason I knew those names is because those names persisted for decades, you know? And I just asked the question, why couldn't my name do the same? Yeah. And I've thought about that ever since. Yeah. So the exposure changed your life. It was everything. Um, you know, I like to say I got to see how the other half lived. Um, and I needed that access to see what the possibility was. And I realized very quickly I can compete with them just like yeah. everybody else could. And that's all I needed. That's all I needed. So were your parents reluctant? Was your mom reluctant to send you to boarding school? My mother was trying to get me out of <laughs> <laughs> She was trying to get me out of home. You know, it's funny. Um, because I, th I think even still to this day, she doesn't really understand the magnitude of impact that that place has had on me, yeah. right? Because, uh, look, you don't want to be the kid who forgot where he came from, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I think she was really instrumental in making sure that, you know, we maintained the values that she brought me up on. Yeah. Um, and I didn't lose sight of that for my entire four years and kind of thereafter. So she had no idea about it. She wasn't reluctant. She was quick to get me out. Um, and I have to give her a lot of credit for pushing me. I was reluctant. Yeah. She was I'm so, I'm, I, I really thought that that was so powerful because so often, especially mothers, hold on to their babies so tightly. And it's like, no, you can't go. You don't. You, you can't do that. I'm too afraid. Mm -hmm. But your mom allowed you to have that wingspan yeah, to go yeah. out here and fly. I mean, her love had the distance, you know, so mm. it wasn't, um, you know, when I was close to her, when I was far from her, love persisted. 
Yeah. Um, and that's something, not only for me, but also my brother and sister, I've always appreciated. And she made the sacrifice, and it was up to me to make the sacrifice. And, mm. um, you know, it does go both ways. Her love persisted. But you persisted. I mean, Try. you started off, uh, I mean, you got the OG resume, you know, Foursquare, Twitter, when Twitter had 20 people <laughs> back in the day, you know. But in 2012, you were an entrepreneur in residence. You were at a venture capitalist uh, firm, and they gave you six to nine months to figure out a business that you wanted to start. Mm -hmm. And you have always said that for seven of those months, you wasted them people's time. You do your homework. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I um, in, in 2008, I moved to Silicon Valley. I had no idea that the place existed. Mm -hmm. like, most of my world was in New England, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey. Yeah. And um, you know, when I was about 23, 24, I knew I wanted to get away from New York. You know, I, been doing that my entire life. I want to change. Yeah. And I said, I want to get as far away from this place as possible. Um, and California provided that access. I mean, that's the furthest you yeah, can go. Yeah, <laughs> it's the furthest you can go. Uh, and there's a school called Stanford and they had a business school. I got in and then learned that Silicon Valley existed. And, you know, I thought I knew what wealth was in boarding school, but what I really knew what it was, was when I went to Silicon Valley because they're the 24 year olds making billions of dollars. Yeah. Not millions of dollars, like billions. billions of dollars. And I knew during those four years that I can compete. So let me try to do this all over again. So it was like rinse and repeat. Um, so I was like, wow, how did I not know about this place for 24 years? Um, and that led me to like the Twitter and the Foursquare and then ultimately Andreessen and Horowitz. But you know, when I say, you know, I spent the first seven months of my time wasting time, you know, they paid me to think of ideas every day, which is probably the best idea or best job I've ever had in <laughs> transparency. But I was trying to build things that I thought would make them proud to support. Yeah, you yeah. said you were chasing the thing you felt would make them proud yeah, of supporting yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, and like it, it wasn't, there wasn't too much authenticity in that. Um, and ultimately, I learned that like in order to have freedom, I had to do the thing that I felt uniquely positioned to do. Uniquely, uh, seven months, I would figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Uniquely positioned to do. I think so. So often we are afraid of being when we're like the only one. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to have the black idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and it, it, it um, you know, I'm embarrassed that I was embarrassed to think about the thing that I probably should have been doing, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, ultimately I started this health and beauty products company for our people, which was the best thing that I could be doing at that time. Yeah. But I didn't want to be like the black guy doing the thing for black <laughs> folks, right? But ultimately I had to realize like, that's the power. Yeah. Um, and I can't see myself doing anything else now. Yeah. I can't. So 2013, you needed a better way to shave. Mm -hmm. Now that, I mean, you know, the beer game is popping. Well, you know, we expanded our line. The beer game, the beer game is popping. Yeah. I mean, you look totally different from your hair shot, uh, you know? Uh, yeah, I heard your thing. wife likes the beer. She is the same. <laughs> <laughs> she likes the beer. Okay, but you wanted to find a better way to shave yeah. and um, the culture wasn't represented. You said yeah. that you were tired of going in the store and seeing the dirty, dusty boxes with the jerry curl, man with the jerry curl on. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You know, when I, when I would pitch uh, investors and I'd tell them that same story, like they would all laugh because they never saw that before. And then one of my first slides in the pitch were like photos of all those <laughs> packages with the dude with the jerry curl in his box and they all shut up. I knew I had something pretty interesting. But in 2013, I couldn't shave. Uh, nobody in the industry tried to make products that help solve problems related to razor bumps and irritation yeah. and all that. Yeah. Um, if I think about every other category, black culture has penetrated those categories in a way to make it sexy and cool and fun and authentic. And it didn't really happen in health and beauty for men. It was happening for women, yeah. but it wasn't happening for men. Uh, and I felt that there was an opportunity for us to really do something special and differentiate. And here I was, a black man who had these issues, had access and exposure to be able to raise millions of dollars to do it, with the pedigree to do it. Uh, and that's when I felt seven months later, wow, somebody has to fund this thing. Yeah. Uh, and fortunately, we had a huge blessing. Somebody did. You had a huge blessing. What was, how did that go? Because you talk yeah. a lot about people just wanting to jump out and fundraise. Mm -hmm. And you didn't just jump out there mm -hmm. and start. Tell I, us that I process. I tried, it just didn't work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for, for a lot of the ideas that I was thinking about, uh, a lot of the investors, um, especially the ideas that weren't authentic to me, that yeah. felt big, 
the investors were like, yeah, you should do it. And it wasn't until I told them about kind of Bevel and Walker and Company, the thing that they didn't understand, that they said, no, nah, I don't think you should try that idea. Um, and I've said in the past, this is the first time in my life, I've been very fortunate, very blessed, very privileged uh, to hear a lot of yeses all the time. And this is the first time for an idea that I had, people started to say no. Um, and that was the first time that I realized that perhaps that's the blessing. Yeah. Too, right. Yeah. Um, because what they thought was a bad idea ultimately was a good idea because I had the best perspective to be able to say that it was needed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I pitched 50 people, 48 of them said no. Wow. But two say yes. Two say yes. Two say yes. So you say you had a breakthrough and a bad idea. Mm -hmm. That was your breakthrough. Yeah. But there was another real breakthrough moment when you finally got your your product in stores, yeah. in Target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you call it the innocent Target story. <laughs> Y'all, he says it's, it's, pretty, innocent, it's innocent, but it's it's pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah, I um, so we, we started in 2013. Um, we, we sell it online, direct to consumer. Then in 2016, uh, we started distribution at Target stores. Um, Funny enough, uh, we had buyers from Target that were using our product that I found out about. I said, hey, we want to be in Target. You know, about a couple months later, we were in Target stores. So we started, this was, I think, January of 2016. Uh, we started distribution in Target stores. Uh, I couldn't go visit them until about April of that year, uh, just because we were really, really busy. Uh, so I took my son, my oldest son at the time. He's eight now. He was two back then. Um, we went to a Target store in Mountain View, California. So it was right by where we were living. Um, I said, let me you know, take him. It's like this momentous occasion, right? Like I take my two-year-old, we get to see our products yeah. in the store. Um, so I take him down the, the shaving aisle, in the shaving aisle, and uh, I'm looking for my products. And we get probably halfway down the aisle, and my son, he could barely talk, but he looks behind me and points and says, Dada, right? Um, so I turn around. And I saw me because I was on one of our boxes, yeah. right? But it was like turning yeah. around. Um, and it was a special moment for me for um, a few reasons. First, uh, just the prime positioning of our products on the shelf, right? Because yeah. you know, we're not at the bottom, dirty. Getting and dirry, yeah, with the Jerry Curl box. Clean, you know? <laughs> uh, above some of the kind of most important brands yeah. ever in the history of the yeah. world, right? So that was meaningful. Um, but second, and I, I, you know, I, I say this a lot, but I really do believe it. Um, two things I thought in that moment that my son wouldn't realize at that moment. First, uh, he'll realize it when he's older, and I could kind of see it now as an eight-year-old when he walks down the aisles, yeah. where he realizes that his needs as a consumer are respected. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. as he gets older, he's going to realize that there are fewer brands that respect those needs. And the second and more important to me, um, I say his dad is on the box. Yeah, you know, his dad made that thing that's in the box. Yeah. Uh, so his ability to believe that he can produce too was profound for me. It's something that was never ingrained in me. Yeah. I got to see some of it in boarding school, but I didn't really know what production meant. I was around a lot of kids that just had inheritance, yeah. right? But no production. Uh, and it clicked for me where I said in 15, 20 years when he's older, uh, he'll feel he has permission. Yeah. And permission. that changed the way I thought about it. I love that because I think that that was part of the reason why you set out mm -hmm. was the impact on the culture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that culture was right here at home. It kicked, that was, uh, I knew I wanted to leave a Denton culture in some way, but I didn't realize how close to home it would get. Yeah. Right. Cause I started the company, gosh, it was 2013. Yeah. My first wasn't born yet. You know, <laughs> he was about to be birthed and, um, you know, once this stuff started to happen and now I walk him down the aisle, even today, and he's like, you know, that's Bevel, that's my dad's product. And yeah. He'll speak to customers in the aisle and say, why aren't you getting <laughs> Bevel? You know, that's, that's powerful to me. He's a brand ambassador. Uh, he better he, be. He's your, he's your influencer. <laughs> he better be. I catch Already. him like, in, the, in the bath with like our hair products and the curl yeah. sponge. He's like eight years old trying to do it. Um, but that, that matters, right? Like Bevel is his default product. It's the first thing he uses. Yeah. It's the only thing he uses. Yeah. So now he expects better. Yeah. And that is part of this whole process. I love that. He yeah. expects better. Yeah. You talked a lot about the impact that you've made on the culture, but most importantly, the impact that you've made at home. Mm -hmm. And that is what's so, so powerful. Do you think that 
many times entrepreneurs overthink their big idea? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think most times entrepreneurs overthink their big idea. Uh, and I think there's evidence to it because most people don't start the thing they think about. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and then when they start it, I think they worry too much about other people competing with them. You know, it's funny in, um, 10 years, this is our 10 year anniversary for Bevel. Wow. We raised before acquisition, $40 million. We sold the company and I could even say to this day, there really isn't such a direct competitor to our product. And I feel like I wasted a lot of time mm. worrying about other people coming in my category, raising money to do the same thing that we're trying to do. Um, but that's the power in feeling like you're uniquely positioned to do something. Because if you are, you are. Yeah. You know? And whoever comes in second is going to be a far second. Uh, so I do think a lot of people overthink it. Number one, they need to start. Number two, they need to not worry about it. But most importantly, uh, they need to feel that they have a unique perspective on the thing that they're trying to sell to people. Yeah. Because you did. I mean, you walk into the art of shaving mm -hmm. and you're they're like, okay, you got to hook me up mm -hmm. with something. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking that they're going to send you to some great system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some, you know, thousand dollar product. Yeah, yeah. And they send you over to a single blade mm -hmm. razor mm -hmm. and said, this is the one. Mm -hmm. They and didn't even like, sell me the thing that was their <laughs> brand, you know? And, you know, look, where I come from, you start to see these inconsistencies. And when they're inconsistencies, you either got to act on it and run, <laughs> you know? Uh, and this is one that I had to act on and it felt like there was a hustle going on somewhere uh, that wasn't being talked about mm -hmm. and I wanted to participate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, you, you're in 2018 mm -hmm. and you said that 2018 started off as the worst year of your life mm -hmm. and ended out to be the best year yeah. of your life. Yeah. Why? Yeah. It's, you know, trials and blessings, man. It's, uh, so we ended the year selling the business and we announced uh, our acquisition of Procter & Gamble on December 12th of 2018, all right? So like from the beginning to the very end. Um, Countdown to the end of the year. Oh yeah, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> um, at the beginning of the year, um, look, we were excited, we were happy, we were motivated, we were growing. I think we grew like 50% year over year. Yeah. Um, but once you start taking money from other people, you have to grow faster than your business might be able to provide. Um, so at the time we were comfortable, we said, you know, we're growing, we'll be able to raise money for yeah. this thing. And we couldn't, nobody wanted to raise money or, um, uh, kind of invest money in the category. Uh, fewer people understood what we were working on and we just couldn't raise any money. One month passes, two months pass, three months pass. You know, you got to pay your people. You got to invest in marketing to grow the business. You got to buy products. Yeah. And this is to the tunes of hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars, right? So you have to fund the business. Uh, and ultimately, around the same time, we had um, some companies reaching out to us, wanting to potentially partner and acquire us, that sort of thing. But we kept them that big because we were like, we're not raising money. Right? Um, but we couldn't. And we started to run out of money. So we said, man, um, we're going to have to do a reduction in force, a layoff. Mm. Um, yeah, I had to lay off half my team. 2018. Uh, yeah, at a time when the business was growing. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people think about when businesses go bad and the bad things happen. Yeah. But I never expected a situation where the business was going good and oh, bad yeah, things had to be done, yeah. you know? Um, so we had to do that. Then we had to really like take these acquisition talks seriously, right? So it was either we were going to not raise money, we're gonna bootstrap this thing, grind it out for a long period of time, or we're gonna engage in some of these conversations and make the vision a reality, right? Like we have a bigger company with more resources that can get us to where we wanna be. Yeah. Um, around that same time, I realized I was going to have a second kid. I was thinking about moving to Atlanta at the time. Um, like all this stuff was happening at the same time. Topsy turvy. I, my body was changing, right? Like the stress was so, so crazy that like it was actually impacting like physical parts of me. Mm. And it was the first time I realized that, um, you know, what I'm thinking in my mind can be very different from how my body's interacting. Yeah. Um, therapy and all that and like she would remind me all the time Tristan when you came in to the time you actually sold the company all this stuff was happening right and she was outside looking in so it was the worst time because I couldn't talk to anybody about it you know I couldn't talk to my employees about it yeah. right um, acquisition talks are confidential mm -hmm. we didn't know if they were going to break down or not right uh, we were 
five or six months away from running out of money, right? I'm thinking about moving to Atlanta, all this stuff. Um, but man, like, you know, those trials are blessings, you know? And we persisted, sold the business, um, and it was the best outcome for the business, for our customers, for me. Um, you just gotta be patient sometimes. What's up everybody? It's your girl, Brandi Harvey. Thanks for watching our video today, but guess what? It does not stop there. I need you to do something. I need you to like, I need you to subscribe, but I also need you to share it with somebody who needs some daily motivation. Make sure you are subscribed to the Vault platform because we got more content on the way. It's your girl, Brandi Harvey. You already know, we empower every day, all day.